Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. I don't know how far east people are. There's got to be somebody in here from Australia or New Zealand or something. We will wait for people to arrive. I am so happy to be here. Thank you, Sketchy, for letting me host, as always. Mm -mm -mm. I managed to move my camera up higher so it's not shooting up from below me as much. I don't know why I didn't do that before. I think I had a better angle when I was doing my last class, but who all is here? I see Margaret. I see Polly. Hey, Polly. Hey, Brenda. I am looking forward to today. I love ink so much. I need to sign up for Inktober. Hanish Ensim, hello, hello Berlin, not Berlin, retracted. Donald, Bobby, Alberta, Canada. So many people from all over the place. I think it's amazing. It's so cool. How's everybody doing today? Good? Does everybody, did everybody, anybody that's drawing along that was in my class, did you, did you pre-watercolor? <laughs> Asian and Australia are sleeping by now? Oh, that's right. Australians are always like, ugh. Hey, Vin, how are you? Hey, Sally. Hey, Ramona. Hey, Cindy. Yeah, I don't know if, um, if who's going to be drawing along. If you're, if you want to draw along and, and you don't, you didn't see that um, we're going to be doing a watercolor and pen uh, exercise today. That's okay. You can just use pen. Um, it's totally fine. I'm going to be focusing on the mark making with pen today uh, just because this, this layer takes a long time to dry, so or at least a long enough time to dry that we wouldn't have gotten to pen easily. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll be doing this pen over top of our watercolor down here and um, and if you don't if you haven't done that maybe just uh, try to sketch the uh, the muse you'll see the link to the muse in the description below so you can just pop open a link and maybe have it in another browser window and do a quick sketch of um, of the shape of the head it doesn't have to be perfect uh, just to give yourself something to work off of Hey, Beth. Uh, that way you can follow along if you want to. Otherwise, you can just watch and ask questions. But yeah, this is like one of my favorite combos is pen plus watercolor or pen plus um, ink wash or pen plus marker wash. All of those are so great. Um, We'll wait for a few more minutes for people to, to kind of get in here. We started a little bit early just so we could say hi so everyone wasn't alone in the chat. Who, who all is taking my class? I know I see a few familiar names in the chat. Just kind of curious. Hey, Annette. Is it beta or beta? Please tell me. <laughs> hey, Brenda, Dawn, Polly. Okay. Josh. Sheila. Oh, you're about to start. That's great. Bobby, you're not caught up. That's totally fine. It's fine. I feel like it's a lot to try to do. Uh, like a class per week and then make the piece and then maybe practice again. Like it's a lot of stuff. Beata. Ah, now I know. Thank you. 
That's trying to get through my Loomis class. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. I feel like I feel like that was a lot to pack into a class. Wow, Ruana, all the all the sketchy classes. All right, we're going to give it just a couple more minutes. I'm so happy that people are taking the class. That's great. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, to this week's lesson today. I don't know how many of you have used gouache, but um, I know for a long time I kind of avoided it because everybody everybody in college used to say they hated gouache, and they used it. They had to use it for color theory class, and so I just avoided gouache entirely. And somehow said, I'm going to learn how to oil paint instead, but I really wish I had started with, with gouache. It's, um, it's such a lovely medium. So yeah, this, this, uh, this week's lesson in the class I think will be a lot of fun because we'll be simultaneously learning about the medium of gouache and then using it to do this mark making, mark making technique, um, which I really haven't seen done too much before. I'm sure people have done it, but it's just I think it's a really good medium for it. Uh, Ramona asks, uh, for my sketchy classes, do I teach elsewhere too? No, these are actually the first online classes that I've done. Uh, Sheila asks, did you do an intro in your class on how to do the color layer? Yep, totally. In the class, um, we probably spend a good 20 minutes or so doing the watercolor layer. So, oh, Beata, you don't have any gouache. I think that that's fine. You, I mean, it's worth watching. If you can just get your hands on some at some point, um, you know, you'll always be able to come down to it. Hey, Anish. Hey, Karen from LA. Dean bought his first gouache set this week in readiness. I think it's going to be fun. Just saying. I can't wait till the next live stream next week and we get to do it. We get to do it all live. Wendy doesn't have gouache either. Uh, Joshua, I went to art school at the Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia forever ago. I graduated in 2001. That's a long time. It's kind of crazy. Okay, I'm going to give it one more minute and then I'm going to start. Yeah, if anybody doesn't have gouache for this next uh, lesson this week, I mean, it's still, I think, worth watching. It's just that there's really no other medium that you can use that is going to have all the same properties of gouache. Um, I don't know if you can order it online. Um, yeah, I don't think, Biat, I don't think Michaels is going to have it. It's, I'm not going to say it's a specialty medium. It's just, it's not as common as acrylic or watercolor or whatever. Um, yeah, Ellen, I know not that long ago. Well, it feels feels like a long long enough time ago for me. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started now. So let me switch over to the other camera. Um, all right, so let's talk about what we're doing today. So in in the lesson in the class, we did this, and I did. I would have liked to have gone darker um, or done more washes with the watercolor. Uh, layer that we did underneath this, but I, I it would have taken a little while to build up. Um, that paint's gray didn't really go as dark as I wanted it to, um, so that's fine. Uh, I think I could have just spent a little bit more time with it and loaded up the brush a little bit more, but this is what we did. You can see that we didn't cover all of the paper or the portrait with ink. We just kind of spent most of our time in the shadow area. Um, so. That's what we did this time. So this time around, um, I, I did a pre-watercolor. Uh, I didn't actually use watercolor, uh, but you can tell it, like, it looks like watercolor, but I did use a watercolor pencil instead. So um, I, I've recently discovered watercolor pencils. I haven't used them a whole lot, but they're a lot of fun. I find that you can have a lot more control over where the watercolor um, pigment goes. And you still get you know the watercolor effect because it is still it's water soluble colored pencil, and you can get in there and kind of get darker in some areas. But I wanted to get a little bit darker of a wash more quickly without saturating the paper so much. So um, that's uh, that's what I did with this yesterday. This is probably about a I don't know like a fifteen or twenty minute kind of sketch, and I I used graphite. 
to kind of create a really light underlayer sketch. And then I just kind of went over it a little bit with this and then filled in a lot of the areas that I wanted to have um, value in uh, just with a light sort of sketch of the pencil and then just took some brushes and went down to it. So um, anyway, that's just if in case you ever want to try these out, they're a lot of fun and you get a really very similar sort of effect uh, to watercolor, just with a little bit more control, which is nice. Um, move this over for a second. So we're just going to use some um, technical pens today. You can use uh, technical pens. You can use like pen um, pen nibs with like dip pens if you want to. Uh, both of them will work fine. I would just recommend that you get something that's really fine. Um, so let's see if I can show you kind of how fine these are. Pretty pretty small. This is an extra small. Um, Pit Artist Pen, and this is a Copic Multiliner. This one's a little bit thicker. So I've just got a couple of thicknesses here. I've got a 0 0.3, 0 0.2. This one's probably about as small as this one. Um, but what we're going to do is we're just going to we're just going to start doing some stuff. And, and what I mean by that is drawing. So uh, let's see. So Carol says, if you don't get gouache, plan on using it. It's expensive and dries out over a relatively short of time. It's a relatively short amount of time. I think gouache can be expensive, but it can also be cheap, just like any other paint. So it just depends on where you get it, and you don't need an expensive set of gouache uh, to do this week's lesson. Uh, okay, so usually when I start off um, one of these kinds of um, drawings, I'll tend to go toward the darker areas just because we know we're going to be putting a lot of marks down in those areas, or at least more. We're definitely going to be putting marks in those areas so that in case I want to use lines in some of the lighter areas, I get the chance to later when I say, oh, I want to darken that value. But I'll never, I'll never start doing the lines um, in the lighter areas first because I may go too dark too quickly. So we're going to try to avoid that. Um, OK. so. Let's start with the glasses, and we're, what we're going to do is we're just going to create some what I keep calling anchor points, which are just areas um, that we can kind of start our lines from when we're actually doing the hatching. So I'm going to zoom in here, and we'll just start. Now, I'm not going to be going, I always say this, I'm not going to be going for accuracy with this drawing. Uh, OK, we're not going to use that pen. does not like it. We're not going to be going for accuracy with this drawing. Um, we're just going to be going for, we're going to be paying attention to shape and value. And value, if you don't know what that is, is the relative lightness and darkness of, um, of the thing that you're, you're drawing or painting. So the first thing I want to try to do is actually outline a lot of the glasses frames. Because we're not going to be able to do any contour hatching here because we're not describing any form with these but it is going to give us a place for us to kind of shoot off of which is going to be nice so let's create that bridge and I'm going to I'm going to do my best to try to get almost an entire drawing done because I still have not managed to do that I'd be really excited if I could actually get one done today Oh, and in the lesson that gets released uh, today, I talk about a couple of different brands of gouache if you need a, something to work from. Okay, so that's, the, that's kind of the base of the frames. We'll, we'll get into the details of it maybe a little bit later. Um, usually I don't like to go too detailed with these kinds of drawings. I just, I'm starting to get more used to doing a little bit more of a, a gestural approach to, to these kinds of watercolor drawings just because I like the quality of, of some of these shapes. So we'll go ahead and start in some of these shadow areas. Now you can see I've kind of created already a shadow area. The whole point of this technique is to let your, your, um, your watercolor layer kind of do a lot of the darkening of value for you um, so that you're not trying to do it all with line. 
So you can then just really focus on describing the form that's underneath. So let's go ahead and start with maybe the glabella, which is that area between your eyebrows. And we will just start making some, some lines and do our best with it. I think I'm gonna not go, a, I need to make a decision here. I either need to go vertical or I need to go across the form. I think I'm gonna go across the form. So with pen, I think you, you'll see me do a lot more sort of like, um, almost whipping of the pencil when I, when I work with a pencil on, um, with contour hatching. I, I, I go a lot faster and I generally tend to be a little bit more expressive with it. But with um, a pen, I find that you have to be a lot more intentional with it. And the same thing goes for gouache. So you'll see me kind of moving a little bit slower. And I, I've started noticing also when I, when I am drawing that I'll do some practice lines or rehearsal lines. It's kind of what I called them. I can't remember where I said that. It was in one of the lessons or it was last week or something. But it's when you see me moving my, my pen kind of back and forth before I've actually done anything um, that I'm kind of trying to envision in my head exactly what the line may look like. So let's go ahead and get some of the eyebrows just a little bit. So I'm already starting to kind of carve out a lot of these forms with, um, within the furrow of the brow. We're gonna do some over here as well. I'm not trying to be too perfect with these lines, but I am trying to make sure that they're approximately equidistant to one another. And you'll notice that I'll use um, sort of shorter strokes in areas um, where there's going to be a little bit more subtlety of form happening. And what I mean by that is up in here, we have much less subtlety of form. We just have these wide swaths, these wide planes across the forehead. But once we start getting into like the furrowing of the brow, there's like a lot of little divots and dimension happening kind of throughout. Like I can see here that there is sort of this muscle that's even allowing the brow to furrow. And so we're gonna go ahead and get in there and kind of describe that. Now I'm not seeing a lot of curving happening in these lines, but that's only because um, of the way, like that's not a very deep form. So we'll go ahead and continue. Some technical pens will have a harder time kind of gripping onto the paper than others, so just be aware of that. Um, okay, so I'm just kind of, I always like end up looking around and I just try to figure out an area that I want to I want to focus on or I want to work on at any given point in time. I don't really know, just this is, tends to be kind of an exploratory uh, technique for me. So let's go ahead and get into the eye maybe. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can remember where my marks were. This is gonna be a little bit weird. Okay, it's probably somewhere around here where the eye was, something like that maybe. Just gonna give myself a little outline here. Looks about right in terms of placement. Who here has used gouache before? I'm just think I'm trying to figure out for, for next week. Just Just curious. Let's go ahead and get some of this eye wrapping around here. Let's 
just skin, skin that's folding down over, over the actual eye and over the eyelid because of gravity over time. Okay, so this is an area that's gonna be pretty dark. Um, I'll probably go in with some cross contour hatching in here, which is where we'll add another sort of layer of curves that crosses over in a different direction on top of our original ones, just to give it a little bit of a darker value. Or we can also go with um, much closer lines if we really wanted to just keep it all going in a single direction. So I'm just thinking about like the bags under the eye, I want them to kind of curve around and under. And then with the eyelids, I want them to kind of keep saying in some of my videos, like I'm thinking about them like tubes almost sitting on top of the face. And then we'll kind of, kind of echo that underneath. Susie used gouache 30 years ago. Yeah, that's a pretty long time. <laughs> Started out with gouache, painting insects and butterflies. Uh, Brenda, you can use one color if you want to for the lesson, or to, I should say, you'll need two different types of paint. You'll need a color and you'll need um, a white. You'll need white, because uh, you'll need to be able to tint up your color. But yeah, you only need a single color if you want to. I'll be doing um, mixing uh, in the video. So I actually have a second camera that I'm using so you can see what I'm doing on my palette, which in my opinion is one of the uh, thing that, things that kind of doesn't exist in a lot of art videos and it makes me very mad. So here's where we're gonna do some cross contour. Um, it makes me mad because it's uh, mixing your paints is like one of the most important things and um, like especially in oil painting and I've just it's it's like impossible well, not impossible but like very few videos I've found actually address that and so I wanted to make sure that everybody could see my palette and how I'm just kind of mixing colors and meandering back and forth gouache is really great for just haphazard mixing and reusing colors that are on your palette. So I wanted to show that quality of the paint. But yeah, you don't need to use really more than one color plus white, but we will be doing more. Hey Andy, good to see you. Sandra says you can't seem to get the flesh tones light enough. Yeah, it's really, I mean, that's one of the qualities of gouache that's really interesting. I know I'm talking a lot about gouache, but um, there's not a whole lot to to ink as a <laughs> as a medium you're just you're drawing lines um, and you're just really trying in this case to be very careful uh, but yeah it's really difficult to get ultra light lights unless you really understand how just how far you can go with tinting um, a pigment because gouache dries so much the lights dry dark and the darks dry light, uh, which can be kind of frustrating. It can be very difficult to work with. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of try to describe this area of the cheek here. We'll do the same thing over here. But yeah, it can be hard to get flesh tones that go really light with somebody that's like Caucasian or whatever. Uh, yeah, yellow would not be the best choice of a single color. <laughs> um, Wendy, good gouache set. I don't have one. Are, Wendy, are you in my class? I can post. Uh, I can post some recommendations in the class if you are, and you can see it there. Okay, I'm gonna try to think about right now, this one's gonna be a little, I'm not really paying a lot of attention. So I wanna think about this shape. It's like a very big shape that has a lot of dimension to it. 
and I'm going to start up here and then as I come down I'm probably going to change my contours to, to kind of fold over this way so we'll start up here and we'll fold over this way and as we come around we'll fold over the other way okay Wendy you are okay I'll, I'll um I will make sure to post something I should leave a little note for myself let me just write a little note for myself post squash that recommendations That's a good idea. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. It goes to SAS. Um, yeah, because there's there's a bunch on there, and that's where I purchased mine. So we can definitely find something that'll work. Okay, just gonna outline a little bit of this nose here, and then we'll go ahead and do those lines that I was talking about. So this is a pretty dark area, so I'm gonna try to keep my lines fairly tight together. And I'm going to make them stop where the kind of the smile crease in the cheek happens. So they're kind of collect. Just to really kind of distinguish that this is going to be a different, a different set of planes um, than what's happening ab above the, the lips. So I'm going to start trying to turn this now. And what I mean by that is my curves are kind of going up and around, and now they're going to start coming over this way, and they're going to start curving around in this direction. Do you need to put that pink color on the head that lightly? I put it a bit too dark. No, it's fine. I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, eventually, you'll want to really kind of learn to control your own your values and stuff, but it's not gonna it's not gonna make it for a bad drawing. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, so we're starting to get a little bit of those curves. Now, like I said, I want to turn over here. I'm going to get a little bit more happening over here. And then I'm going to think about the lightness that's happening there. Um, if I was more careful, I would have left um, some of these. I meant to leave some of these areas a little bit more highlighted. Uh, so that you could really see um, the form a lot better, but I screwed up. <laughs> so, uh, but that's that's the beauty of the mediums. Just got to make it work. So again, I'm I'm turning my my hatching over here just to give myself a little bit of a slightly different angle and form to work with and I'm actually going to start tightening it up as we start getting into this area where the skin starts to bunch a little bit. Let's go and find that lip. Where does the lip meet? Somewhere in there. So we're just going to meander around the face. Um, Alternate, alternative Art Star asks, um, have I ever uh, tried the jelly gouache sets? No, I have not. I've only tried a couple of gouache sets. Um, and they're, they're good. I, I've been wanting to try like an acryl acrylic gouache, which is an acrylic gouache combination, but I really like the gouaches. Um, uh, what do you call it? Gouache is just water soluble and you can get it up, whereas acrylic has um, like basically a plastic binder in it. So I don't know how, how forgiving that one is. Okay, so let's come back over here. So we were working on this kind of area down in the mouth and uh, just trying to try and kind of trying to describe some of, there's like a lot of curves happening in here. That's why I like Orville's face here. So I'm just going to try to start to meander around these forms a little bit, thinking about where they turn in on themselves. Some of this might get a little bit messy, which is OK. So 
So we've got a lot of really fun shapes kind of twisting inside of themselves here. Just gonna do my best to describe them in some fashion. And then we're gonna get some really dark areas in here and then under the nose. Those are gonna be the darkest areas besides the, the eyes. Um, speaking of which, I wanna come back to the eyes now that I've got more value kind of laid down. I'm gonna squint my own eyes and I'm gonna see where I need to darken things up. And this is gonna be where we probably lose some of the quality of the, of the contour because we're gonna come in and we're going to do some cross contour hatching here. That is just gonna lose some of the line quality for us. But I am still gonna try to Still going to try to really describe and go along with the forms. Just looking to see where some of these darker areas are. Your lines aren't evenly distributed. Does that matter? Uh, what do you What do you mean by evenly distributed? Can you describe that? Do you mean like the closeness next to each other, or um, yeah? Tell me what you mean by that more. Okay, we're gonna get into this kind of starting to get into the jowly area. We're going to do another kind of outside pass here. And I'm probably going to create an edge, more formal edge there. Oh, Fiona, you're waiting for the paint to dry so you can start inking. Yeah, that's why I that's why I pre pre water colored so that I wouldn't have to wait for the paint to dry. Okay, so with these like less organic shapes, usually what I do is I just kind of follow the planes to use lines to describe those areas. So in this case, there's like a flat plane and I wanna use, um, I wanna use vertical lines to kind of describe that plane. Okay, um, it's going to create, create some stuff on the ear here, just some really minor, minor lines. Maybe we outline this a little bit. I'm not going to outline it completely. I like to make sure I keep my um, kind of lines varied so that we have some interest. I don't just want to outline everything. Sometimes we just want the edges of a value to push up against another value and kind of create an implied line. The spaces between the lines differ. Some spaces are uh, larger than others. Let me just put that out here. Bing. So yeah, I think Julie is calling out something that um, is really it's purely about practice. So getting used to um, being able to consistently keep the lines sort of this kind of the same distance apart or pretty darn near it for these individual passages is just something that needs to be practiced. But I do feel that it's one of the things that is um, pretty crucial to learn and get right for the effect and the technique to really feel good 
and right. And you want to kind of keep it kind of, you know, I would say consistent even throughout, even as you get to lighter areas. Now that your mileage may vary on that, but for the most part, um, you'll you'll you won't want to have a lot of variance throughout throughout the actual drawing itself, uh, which will just tie everything together a little bit better. The exception to that would be when you're doing some of that cross contour stuff that I had to do up at the top, where you're actually putting lines on top of one another. So it's it's it, honestly it's just a dexterity thing. So you'll 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 get it if you just um, practice it. I've been practicing it for a long time, so it's a uh, it's kind of come naturally to me now. We're going to continue down to the mouth area. So sometimes you. Okay, here's, here's one place where you might want to go into sort of a different line width. So in this particular area, that's as close as I can get, I'm sorry. There'll be times when like a form um, like curves outward to you. So like the bottom of this lip, for instance, um, this area above the chin is literally kind of coming out at you. And so you can think about it almost like a pumpkin. And so as as the form turns away from you if there were a bunch of ridges on his mouth they would get closer visually they would get closer um, not significantly but as they kind of turn away from you but as they're very close to you which is kind of the plane that's facing you they would be wider apart and so you can use the spreading of line the distance between line to really accentuate uh, that that curvature so that's one area where you might want to change it, but it's still a regular thing only because you're going from really close, really close to further, 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 and then coming back and coming close again is what would happen. So it doesn't look like they're you know, sporadically wider or closer, which I think is important. So there's, there's one, one way uh, to think about that. This is a really good question, Sheila. So my lines itself seem interesting. Is it that there's more pressure at the start of the line and then you let up pressure so that there's like a taper? Yeah, that is that is a thing that I do um, with pencil, with gouache, with every single medium that I use. Uh, I, I do, like I said, I, at the beginning of this video, I was talking about how I kind of flick my pencil um, when I'm doing uh, colored pencil or graphite drawings and sometimes I'll also do it when I'm doing ink pen uh, Depending upon the nature of the drawing that I'm doing, but yes, I, I do I do do that so You may want to mess around with that too. That's like just sort of another added level I would say of dexterity to be able to control the pressure throughout the entire stroke Okay, so where do I want to go from here? I want to create another kind of surface here. So another thing about this technique is you don't really have to um, use all or try to try to recreate all of the actual planes that you're seeing. You can kind of invent some and just create more bumps and ridges where you want to. It ends up adding a lot of visual interest. which is kind of what I'm doing now a little bit. Although there's a lot of stuff happening in his chin too, so. I really like doing these drawings in pen. I think that they're more meditative than um, other mediums when doing this kind of technique. Uh, maybe we'll come up and well, let's 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 create a little bit of a hard line underneath this chin here, just to give ourselves a little bit more grounding. A 
will kind of let it disappear off over there. Um, okay, let's see. Do I want to do anything else in this area right now? I can do a little bit of cross contour hatching just to get this area a little bit darker. And then we'll kind of do it a little bit more in here. Mostly just really kind of creating just a very distinct line because there's not a lot of additional form that we're going to be able to describe with our lines. So we're just going to kind of harden up that, that mouth area. Okay, so I'm coming back up here right now. I'm just going to think about the eye a little bit. Just want that Terminator shadow to be a little bit darker. Okay, I'll leave this area for now. Let's go into this nose area. Start doing some fun stuff in there. So just kind of looking at that shadow of the what are they called on glasses? They're not feet, I can't remember what they're called. Um, am I putting a lot of pressure in my lines? Am I worried if they get a bit even? Uh, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on my lines. I'm trying to keep it so that I can still feel my lines being gestural. And what I mean by that is I can move my pen pretty freely and not worry too much about like creating a very hard line. Uh, you want to loosen up a little bit when you're doing this kind of technique. Um, but I'm not like, I'm not personally thinking too much about how close my lines are, but that's only because I've practiced it so much that it's kind of second nature. So I think that if you're doing this for the first time, you'll probably find yourself thinking a lot more about how close your lines are and trying to be really intentional with that. But um, just it all comes with practice, like I always say. Okay, so we're just really reinforcing that shadow. Now he's got we've got a dual lighting system. We've got a lamp that's coming in. Sorry, we've got a lamp coming in from this way. You can see it's like unnatural light, and then it looks like there's like daylight coming in from this way. And so what we're getting is um, sort of dual lighting. So this is light, this is light, and then this is all gonna be shadow. I just wanna call that out uh, as we're kind of going through this. Usually it's easier to work with one light source so that you know how the light should be hitting. So we're gonna create those creases a little bit more defined in his brow. You're worried about your lines coming uneven? I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> I just wouldn't worry about it. I think that it's fine. It's okay. You'll fix it next time. You'll do better next time. So now I'm just kind of describing that transition plane that happens up near the skull. And coming back down to the nose. I always find myself getting distracted by other shapes on the face just because I really like a lot of the shapes on the face. So I want to get a little bit of value in here, just a little bit. So I'm just going to throw some, some lines in here, not putting them really close. So this is one time when I'll actually create or intentionally keep them further apart just so that I get a little bit of form described by the lines and I can darken down the value a little bit. Okay, so now we're gonna do up here. And again, this is one of those areas where I actually don't wanna make it too dark because this is technically in the light. Just wanna give it a little bit of curvature. And then the same thing on this part of the nose. So I'm going further apart with these lines here than I am in some of the other areas. And again, it's just to give a little bit of indication of volume, but not try to go and make it um, too dark, because when you put the lines closer together, it actually makes that perceived area darker in terms of value. 
Okay, so we've got some really fun shapes happening over here. Um, like this shape on the bridge and this at the side of the nose is a really fun shape. So I'm gonna describe it like this. Again, this is an area where we don't want to go too dense with our lines because we don't want to darken that area too much. What point size of my pen? Uh, this is an extra small, which I would probably say is like a 0.2 millimeter, just because it it feels about the same as oops, feels about the same as this one, and I think that's what the 0.2 means. <laughs> I'm not totally sure actually. But yeah, it's, it's pretty it's pretty small. Um, it's smaller than like a 0.5, you know, um, millimeter like, mechanical pencil. That's for sure. All right, so let's get some of this. I like to use uh, the thinner ones for a drawing that's this size. And a drawing, the drawing is uh, that's the size of my hand. So I don't know. This is like six by ten or something like that. Is probably how big this drawing is. So I like to um, use a really thin pen in these particular instances, and then use um, thicker pens if I'm going bigger. Dean, you found the shadow ma mapping exercise when I was doing the pencil foundation in lesson three really helpful. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people, uh, I'm, I'm glad first, um, but I think a lot of people, I haven't like taught that anywhere yet. And I know that it's a, it's a, it's like sort of a foundational technique that I don't think is really described or expressed very much. Um, unless you're at like an atelier or something. Uh, so yeah, it's it's something to learn for sure. It's like the next, once you've created the foundation for the face through placement of features and such, as long as the, the um, subject is well lit so that you have good strong highlights and good strong shadows, um, that next step of creating the shadow map really breathes life into the form as long as you've um, as long as you've got all your features and stuff placed correctly or as close to correctly as possible uh, so yeah that's a that's something that i think a lot of folks really want to learn how to do Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and get this other eye placed over here. And we're not going to worry too much about accuracy of the shape of it or anything like that. I'm just kind of roughing in something here. Just making sure that it's kind of in the right location. And again, I'm just using normal lines here, but I'm trying to I'm trying not to just outline it. I'm actually trying to um, use varying you know, just like little little bits of line here and there. And then I'm going to go in and, and actually use line to fill this in. So I'm not going to just kind of scribble. I'm going to use these curved vertical lines. And then try, really try to uh, keep the line quality consistent or interesting, even in little spaces like this. Ellen asks, how am I paying attention to the underlying values while describing contours? How does it affect your choices? So I'm looking at the darker areas firstly, and I know that I can put more lines down and more like closer densities, like what's happening up in here. Um, so that's, that's one thing I'm thinking about is just when I know that like, for instance, this area underneath the eye. So let's, let's try to describe that in some sense. So I'm probably going to think about, first I'll, I'll kind of create a line that'll describe maybe the edge of it, the bottom edge of that, of that, that plane or that curve that I, or form I want to create. And then I'll do some really 
dense line work because I know that this value is darker. So I've got the color underneath already to, to help me get to that darker value. And then I'll use density of line um, where possible to make it, make it even darker. And then I'm gonna create another form here. That's gonna be just like another place where things move. And then as we start turning away, we're getting lighter. And the watercolor is doing some of this for us, but it's at this point that I would, I would probably like start spreading out my lines a little bit more. And I'm just kind of doing this value adjustment as I move through to figure out where, where do I need to help the watercolor get darker or where can it help me get darker um, or where do I need to make sure no matter what that I'm really describing the forms adequately is even in like a light area. So I don't know, it's like a little bit just, you're kind of just playing back and forth with it. Um, yeah, when do I let the watercolor do the value work and when, when the lines, I'm gonna put this up too. Uh, in some, actually, let me just bring up one drawing really quick. I posted this to the, to the school yesterday. I think it was yesterday. So in this particular drawing, for instance, which is also watercolor and ink, there's lines covering everything, right? And so I think that that's an aesthetic choice uh, to, to, to let the lines do the, uh, do the work or let the watercolor do the work. Because if you actually look through this drawing, all the lines are pretty much um, the same distance apart. It's like the same amount of space, no matter where you go. So the lines in this case really are just about describing form and texture and are being used for texture. Whereas here, we're, we're starting to kind of use it for both of those things. We're giving, we're giving it texture, but we're also describing form and we're also using it to try to accentuate or like push value deeper where it needs to be. So I would say, that it's really just about, just about, it's really about um, making that decision early on for like how you want, how you actually want to use the lines. What is your intention behind the lines? Uh, it's probably, I mean, the point of this technique is to describe form. So that's, that is kind of a given. And then the question becomes like, how much of it do you want it to describe texture? like the actual texture of the subject. How much do you want it just to be adding a texture? So just like another kind of um, thing that's happening in the piece, much like watercolor has a visual texture to it, et cetera. How much of it is just a design element for your drawing, for your painting? So I don't know, these are just sort of decisions I think that you make and it, it kind of happens over time. Like I didn't know, I was initially gonna do this drawing like kind of like that drawing I just showed you in my sketchbook. Uh, and then I didn't cause I started talking and then I just kind of let my, my hands do what they're gonna do. Uh, and so I kind of um, just wanted to start using it to, to just to describe form as I, as I saw fit for whatever felt good for me. But I could totally see doing this drawing the other way where it was just using long controlled lines, evenly spaced to uh, create just like more visual rhythms throughout the piece. So I'm doing that thing again where I'm kind of going, going around this form, just thinking about how it's turning. It's almost like a big inner tube or something. So here's an area where I didn't get sort of it dark enough in the watercolor part. I think you can see that if you squint your eyes at the reference. I didn't get it dark enough in the watercolor part because this is all kind of the same value. So I'm actually gonna use my contour hatching to be able to get me into that spot. So we're gonna go a little bit closer with our lines and we might even do some cross contours. So now when I squint at that, it's starting to get darker. And then I might come in and do another, another set. 
just to get it a little bit more. And then we'll kind of carry those lines that we were just making outward. Because I can see that that sort of shape and that form is curving around that way. So we just got some darkness there. And then we're going to do the same thing up here in the lip. And then we're actually going to use the pen here because it's not that bright. It's not like a bright white highlight to push it back a little bit. And so now if we like zoom out a little bit, we can start to see where like if I it's this is basically like squinting. Um, if you squinted this now, I can start to see where I need to darken areas. So like this whole chunk could stand to be darkened. So I'm going to use some cross contour techniques to do that. And we can do that over here too. So this is different from just cross hatching again because we're actually using curves and we're thinking about it how how these lines actually move around the form. It's just going to give us that extra bit of dimension where we might otherwise not have it, but we're using it also to push um, things into the a darker area, a darker value. Do the same thing here and here. And up here. Okay. Uh, what is the brand of this pen? It's a Faber Castell. These are good. They're not my favorite. I really prefer the the Copic multi liners. Now I'm just going to create some really light lines here, just to give a little bit of some form. Um, doing a time check for myself right now. I've got about seven minutes. This is just like a really relaxing stream. Yeah, the only reason why I don't like these so much is that um, they tend to, to sort of scumble on the paper a little bit, so you don't get really consistent lines which is fine. It's just they almost feel a little too scratchy and dry. And that's mostly because of the nib. I don't know if it's most if it's because of the ink so much. But I think it's the nib. It just feels like a little bit of a felt a felt kind of nib. So with these these contours, I think you can see it in here. I'm kind of creating multiple layers of just like where the, the bottom, the area under the lip might start turning in and how it might intersect with another sort of set of planes and how it kind of gets into the chin where things get a little bit messy in here and then it kind of curves away. Um, some of this is invented, some of this is, is observed, but um, I think it's really important if you're doing something like this, because I've seen it in some folks' drawings, that you're doing it with intention. You're not just like creating a band of lines and creating a band of lines and creating a band of lines just for the sake of creating bands of lines. I'm actually trying to create these feelings of the form um, kind of sitting on itself or rolling over itself. Oh, Beata, don't, don't worry about, you won't ruin it, I promise. Or if you do, that's fine. Hopefully you just, you end up learning something from it. I think the key is just thinking about making sure that they don't run too much in the same direction. That's it. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to call that out. Like try not to 
just to do like this idea of banding for the sake of it uh, it'll I don't think it, it doesn't look quite correct because it it's not actually describing any forms that even could be there it's it's really just uh, it's just making the marks for the sake of making the marks, which is not what we're trying to do here. So look out, look out if you see yourself starting to do that, where you're just creating strips of lines, um, and then try not to do it. <laughs> look out for yourself doing something and then don't do it. That's my advice. By the way, if you're in the class, I think this happened a lot more in my other class because it was a much more sort of formalized drawing class, but if you're in the class, um, I would, uh, or you can at tag me, so you, like, in a comment or a post that you make, you can type in at Mike Creighton, uh, and it'll start to, like, fill in my name and give you a little pull-down menu where you can choose my name. Um, if you want, like, a critique or something on the work, I'm not going to be super harsh unless you want me to be, but um, just tag me, and I will absolutely... Um, give you a critique. It can sometimes be a little hard for me to find all the comments in the in the community because they're either on the activity feed or they're in comments on the actual lesson pages or some of you just post your own you know your own stuff in the activity feed and I might not see it if I'm not tagged in there. So I just um, want you to know that I am more than happy to look at your work. I'm, I'm still looking at people's work. I just, I do it in batches, but I'm happy to give you, give you a critique um, if you want it or just feedback or whatever. You can just let me know what you're looking for and I will do my best to uh, give you that feedback. I just want everybody to feel like they're getting what they can out of the class and anything that feels confusing can get explained. Oh yeah. That's right, there is a special special offer. Um, buy any one of my classes, which are two classes right now, and then get 40% off another class. It doesn't have to be my class. It can be any, any class. Uh, yeah, it's a really good deal. So I recommend doing one of my classes and then Inktober, because that's happening. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to give it over to Dylan. Dylan is doing some magical ink stuff, as he always does. I think it's going to be great. Uh, so go check that out. It's still on the sketchy uh, YouTube channel. Um, hopefully you're playing around with this a little bit. You can start to see a little bit more of that form kind of coming through. Um, I'll probably meander on this a little bit later in the day and uh, post it to the classes page. And I will post a list of recommended gouache sets that you can purchase on Amazon. So. Thanks for joining in, or joining in. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, I hope you had a good time. And I will see you next week, every week, Sunday, 9 a.m. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs>